Good morning, HSM. Welcome everyone to our live YouTube service today. I'm very excited to be joining you today, and I'm even more excited that the smoke Mageddon that is happening this week, this ridiculous smoke that is happening, uh, happened this weekend, not on Sunday. It was so fun to see a bunch of you on Sunday. I missed your faces so much, even if I just get to see you on Zoom or even if I get to chat with you. Uh, it was it was super awesome to, to see you out there. Thanks to those that came and braved the, the heat and the lighter smoke. Uh, we really appreciate it, and hopefully we can do that again soon. Smoke permitting and uh, timing and how we work that out with the church, because the whole church, uh, has the the park, but we have to kind of work around it. But hopefully we can do that again soon and maybe even uh, meet in uh, outdoors at homes soon as well for life groups. Uh, speaking of life groups, if you have not signed up for life groups, uh, link is down in the description. You can check that out. Come join us. Um, it's super fun. And we get into um, our Bible story a little bit more than we do on Sunday morning. So come join us at life groups on uh, Thursday nights. You can also check out what we have up on our Instagram. Um, that is at, at CBCFCHSM. And, and you can check out what we got going on. We post stuff, uh, hopefully, at least three or four times a week. Um, anyways, I hope you all are having a, a great week of school. Um, hope you enjoyed some orange weather. Uh, but also, this week, um, it was kind of a reminder of something that happened when I went in high school. It, yeah, um, today, I'm, I'm recording this on, on Saturday. Um, and I kind of like to record on Saturday because it gets me through the week and I can kind of see what happened during the week. And if anything happens, I, I can comment on it and say talk about it. Um, but yesterday, September 11th, um, was is a big day in the history of the U.S. I remember as a sophomore in high school being woken up on sleeping day, of course. Thanks, Mom. Appreciate it. Why are you waking me up? My mom is crying. I'm thinking, okay, who in the family has died? And I remember wait, like being woken up and being, come, come, come look, come look at the TV. Something is happening. And I remember that morning, 19 years ago, I was a sophomore in high school, which is crazy to me. But, uh, and none, none of you were born yet when this happened. You, This is all old history for you. Uh, this is a history book kind of moment. But for me, it was it was something that was, that was so ingrained to me. And you guys and gals are gonna have the coronavirus as part of your high school story. And how are we gonna use that story um, and what we learned and how we went, go through it um, in the future um, as, we, as we talk about and share our faith. How are we using this moment? Um, and I know that there was, there was craziness with, with 9-11 for us and the, 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 the World Trade Center attacks, but that, that was one day. I, this, is, this has been such a crazy it's been, I feel like it's been almost a year, but we've been in shelter in place about six months now. And uh, I pray that God is using this for you. you. God is using this time. Maybe it's time to connect with family. Maybe it's time that maybe you didn't get to connect very well with family that's, that's far away, but you've started to connect with them even better. And uh, I hope that, that all of you are, are taking this time to, to reflect on what, what God is going to use it for. Uh, and how God is going to use this this time in our lives for something so amazing. And let's think about that as we as we head on into a time of worship and reflection. And then after that, uh, we get a message today from uh, the old uh, temporary high school pastor, uh, now generations pastor, Kevin Snee. So let's head into a time of worship. say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. Right now, right now I'm losing back. Stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be alright. Right now, When there's nothing to bring me down What will I say when I'm held to the flame Like I am right now I 
I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone They say it only takes a little faith To move a mountain Good thing A little faith is all I have right now God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable HSM, it is good um, to be connecting with you today. My name is Kevin. I'm the Generations Pastor here at CPC, and good to see some of you this past Sunday. I know some of you guys were out at Leo Ryan uh, for our um, in-person gathering, the first one since March, which is crazy, uh, but it's good to see so many of you, some of you that I know, some I don't know, uh, but I'm glad to be joining with you guys on YouTube this morning um, and continuing your guys' series, Looking at the Life of Joseph. And we're going to jump into the text here in Genesis in a little bit. Um, But before that, you know, it's no surprise um, if I were to tell you that we live in an information saturated age. Uh, I mean, there is there is nothing that would mark our age more than just the onslaught of information. And and you know what's fascinating is I was I was doing a little research on how much information we take in, or how much is even uh, even more not even necessarily what we take in, but how much is available to us. So check this out: if you took the big four tech companies of Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook, right? If you just took those four. Um, It's estimated, uh, because it's hard to nail this down, but it's estimated that they have 1,200 
petabytes of knowledge. Now, one petabyte is 10 to the 15th power of bytes. All right, so one petabyte is 10 to the 15th um, power of bytes, and it's estimated that those four combined have 1,200 petabytes. Um, that's the equivalent of 1.2 million terabytes of information. 1.2 million terabytes of information. Now, again, this is like insane. Like it is, it's, these are numbers we can't wrap our head around the amount of information that is available to all of us. And that's just four of the big tech companies. Like it's insane. This is not like anything else the world has ever seen. And it continues to expand. This was actually the data I found here, I think it was from like two, three years ago. So I certainly it's exploded even since then, but here's the problem. Okay, so 1,200 1, petabytes of information available on just four companies, but it's estimated that our brains, the average brain, can store an estimated 2.5 petabytes. Now, that's insane enough to think that our brains have 2.5 petabytes of information, or at least what's available to be stored in your brain. But again, remember, those four, just those four companies offer 1,200 petabytes so we have this incredible discrepancy between what we can store and what is offered to us. All right now, this poses a huge problem uh, because your brain holding um, 2.5 petabytes, which by the way is 3 million hours of TV shows. <laughs> right, think about it. 3.5 million hours of TV shows is what your brain can hold. So that's already an insane amount. But the problem is this. There's this huge discrepancy of what's available, right? And what our brain can actually store. And so this leads to all sorts of issues. It leads to info or information fatigue or, or just flat being overwhelmed. I mean, again, have any of you experienced that sense of just being overwhelmed by all of the information that's like flooding you all the time? Um, and this information overload, uh, you know, it leads to uh, kind of what, what some scientists call brain fog. Right, where your brain is just clouded with so much, it kind of renders you moot. Like you just can't do anything. It, it leads to decision making complications when you're trying to navigate, like, how do we move through this like ocean of information? Um, it leads to anxiety. It, it, it um, means it's difficult to focus. Um, critical thinking becomes impaired. I mean, all of this information that you all are flooded with, largely because of the iPhone that's in your pocket, um, that is just filling and pumping our world with information as it leads to all these issues. And so the question then becomes is how do we, how do we navigate a world like this? How do we navigate a world that's so saturated with information that it's almost impossible to even fathom the amount that's available to us? Like, how do we navigate that? What do we do? Well, I would suggest that what is needed almost ex like more than anything else in our world today is this concept of wisdom. Because wisdom allows us to navigate this overwhelming amount of information. Uh, you know, it, 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 if, if we're rendered kind of like paralyzed by this information, it isn't that the information is inherently bad. It isn't even that the access to the information is inherently bad. The issue is that we don't know how to navigate our way around it. And so in a world saturate, saturated with so much of this, we have to then look to how do we find our way through this? And again, the answer is wisdom. You know, I was reminded of this idea of wisdom. Uh, there's a text in, in Job, the book of Job in the, old, in the Old Testament. And Job is this story where this guy loses almost everything that's of value to him. He loses his family. He loses his wealth. He loses everything. He becomes sick. And, and, and it's just this terrifying story where he loses everything. And so then he's on this quest to kind of make his way through this just utter disaster. And, and you see this in chapter 28 of Job. It's, it starts in verse 12. Um, he says, but where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me. The sea says it's not in me. It can't be bought with the finest gold, nor its price weighed out in silver. It can't be bought with the gold of Ophir or with the precious onyx or lapis luzula. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. 
And he goes on, he says, all of these kind of rubies, this weight, this, this money, none of it can buy wisdom. So it goes on in verse 20, where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the end of the earth. And sees everything under the heavens when he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Right. So, so I love this text because Job is looking around and saying, how do I find wisdom? I look everywhere. I look in the seas. I look in the skies. I look in money. I look in wealth. I look in power. I look in all of these things. And it says that the only one who knows where wisdom is, is God, because God is the one who had measured out the sea, who had laid out the ocean. He's the one that created everything. And so therefore he understands it. And then after all of that, he says, listen, if you want wisdom, if you want to understand it, he says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Now, this idea of the fear of the Lord is important for us to understand it. It comes from more of this idea of reverence, this idea of when you are in the presence of something so much beyond your understanding, he says, then there's this kind of holy like fear, if you will. And he says, that is when wisdom begins. It's when we understand our positioning in place of who God is. This is that is where wisdom begins. And I love this, this series you've been in because you've been looking at the story of Joseph and Joseph is a fascinating character uh, because he lives a story in which life did not go as planned. Uh, but yet you see his knowledge of the world, his understanding of the world mixed with his experience That was not what he had intended, not what he would even set out, but that mixture of the knowledge and the experience of life come together to create this wise man named Joseph. And so last week in the story, you saw him um, and he was interpreting, he was in prison and he was interpreting um, a dream for someone in prison. And we're going to see the way in which that will then become um, a, a cornerstone for the story we're in now. So if you have your Bibles, grab them and turn to Genesis chapter 41. And so in Genesis chapter 41, we're going to see the value of what wisdom plays in the life of Joseph. And so Joseph is, you know, he's on this journey to see and understand his, his dreams, his understanding of the world, what he wants to accomplish. And we see this kind of tumultuous road that he's been on. And here's the point that I want you to get today. All right. It's as simple as this. It's that wisdom leads your dreams to God's plans. Wisdom leads your dreams to God's plans. Because again, for so many of us, we can have our dreams and our ambitions and all those things. And God wants us to have those and he wants us to pursue those things. Um, But so often our dreams can be counter to what God's plans are. And what we find is as we wrap ourselves up in the story of God, as we, as we begin to follow Jesus, we live into that promise that Jesus has come to give life and life to the fullest. And it's in that fullness of life that we find God's plans merging, or, our, or I should say, our dreams merging with God's plans. And that is where we find flourishing. So check this out again. So um, Gerald, um, if Gerald, Joseph does this for um, the chief cupbearer, right? He does this, this in, interpretive move and it like, it saves this guy. And so he says, he, you know, he would never forget him or anything like that. But then it says this in chapter 41 of Genesis verse one, it says when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. So we're two years from the end of chapter 40. And it says in two years later, Pharaoh has this dream. Now, this dream is a bit, um, it's something else, right? So I want to read this, but this is, again, Pharaoh, who's in charge of Egypt at the time, right? He's having this dream and he's going to be confused by it, which as I read it, it's going to make sense. And he's going to look for someone who can interpret it. And this is where Joseph is going to come in. So it says this, uh, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. And here's the dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river, there came up seven cows, sleek and fat. 
and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven ears of corn, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears of corn sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven healthy full ears. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. And I love this in verse 8. In the morning, his mind was troubled. (laughs) That seems like a no-brainer, right? Like he has this crazy dream of these seven skinny cows eating these fat cows. And then he has this dream about the ears of corn and the withered ones are swallowing up the healthy ones. Um, In all honesty, it makes sense that he wakes up and his mind is a bit troubled. (laughs) He's a bit concerned about these dreams. So as this is happening, Pharaoh says, how am I going to figure out what these dreams mean? Like, how do I understand what in the world I just witnessed? So he calls all of these different people in the land. He calls some magicians. He calls um, the baker, the chief baker that we had talked about before. He calls all these people to try to help him interpret these dreams. And as the baker gets there, he remembers Joseph and remembers what Joseph had done. And so he says, I know of someone who can interpret this dream for you. So he calls to Joseph. Joseph comes before Pharaoh and says he was quickly brought from the dungeon. This is verse 14 of chapter 41. Um, It says, when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said that of you, um, I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And listen to what Joseph says next. I think this is really interesting. He says, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I think it's so interesting because the first thing that we see Joseph do is that Joseph, in a way, asks for wisdom, right? He understands the complexity of the moment and he says, listen, I can't do it on my own, but I believe and trust this source of wisdom. Just as Job has said, the source of wisdom is God. And God says, listen, I understand the way the world works. I understand all of this. I have that wisdom. And so Joseph, rather than leaning into his own understanding, he actually asks for wisdom, right? He understands that the the wisdom has nothing to do with him. And here's again, I think, where we need to learn from Joseph. We so often equate information. We so often equate knowledge with wisdom. And so we rush to the 1,200 petabytes of information. We pull our phones out thinking that it has the answer to everything that we need to know. And the reality is we're just flooded with information with no idea of how to navigate it. But Joseph says, listen, I am not the one in control, but rather God will understand that he will give Pharaoh the answer he wants. You see, and and again, in our life as we're navigating, how do we understand our dreams, our plans, our visions of things? What we need again is to ask for wisdom so that we don't just flood to all this vast ocean of information that we may or may not understand, that may or may not be good advice, but rather we look to God, we begin to seek God um, because he is the source of wisdom. And so it's then in that wisdom that our dreams merge with God's plans. And we'll see that play out here in a second. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. There's a, there's a text in James chapter one in the new Testament, um, that talks about this and it talks about, you know, if anyone lacks wisdom, it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. James says it's simple. If you want wisdom, ask for it and God will give it. If you're looking for wisdom into what college to go to, um, ask for it and God will give it. Uh, If you're looking for wisdom into how to navigate this situation with a friend, ask God for wisdom. So so give it generously and without reproach. How often do we rush to every other answer before we think about asking God who gives wisdom to us generously? In uh, Proverbs 4, 7, um, it says the beginning of wisdom is this, to get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. I love that. He says, the beginning of wisdom is to go get wisdom. (laughs) And and I I love that because the initial step isn't just to flood and and find the answer and look for info and this and that and that. But Proverbs says, listen, the, the beginning of wisdom is that you just go and get wisdom. 
which seems interesting. Like, how do we how do we do that? How do we go about this idea of just getting wisdom? Well, again, I think it, be, it means that we 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 search it out. You know, for Joseph, it was again this knowledge of the world mixed with his experience of life that then manifest this this hunger for God to help him understand what was going on and then to get wisdom from that. So I think for some of us, it's that we ask for wisdom, but then we seek out those who can help us navigate this world, getting that wisdom that God offers. So next, the story goes on. And what we see next is that, um, again, Joseph asks for wisdom. <coughs> but then um, beyond that, you know, Joseph has to then accept the wisdom. And what we see later in the story is as he understands how to, to interpret this dream, which is essentially that there was going to be seven years of famine in the land, and then there was going to be seven years um, of plenty. And so to navigate the seven years, they needed to store up food and grain and take some rations from that ahead of time so that when the seven years of famine came, they would be prepared for it. And so, so Joseph understands the story, but he has to accept that because the reality is this, is that seven years of famine was not good news, right? Like none of us want this sort of good news. But again, the reality is, is that's the wisdom that God is giving is that there will be trouble. There will be problems that come and to navigate that we need wisdom, whether or not we like it, whether or not it's advice that we want to listen to or not, we have to listen to it. And so if you ask for wisdom, the second step is just like Joseph, he accepts the wisdom. You know, again, it isn't the greatest of news, but he's willing to accept it. Another text in Proverbs 4, which Proverbs 4 is just t- filled um, with these little like nuggets of wisdom. It says this in, in Proverbs 4, 5, <clears throat> it says, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. And, and in the Old Testament, um, oftentimes wisdom was depicted as a woman, uh, which in, in my experience makes a whole lot more sense than it being depicted by a man. Uh, it makes a whole lot of sense to me. But it says, do not forsake her and she will keep you. Again, that her there is wisdom. Love her and she will guard you. See, whatever the wisdom that God gives us through his scriptures, through the community of faith, whatever wisdom he gives you through the Bible, accept it, learn to love it, take care of it, and it will protect you as well. So Joseph asks for wisdom, Joseph accepts the wisdom, but there's one final step that all of us need, and it's this, is that Joseph must apply the wisdom. It's one thing to understand the step to do. It's another thing even to accept that, even if it's difficult. But it's a whole nother level to actually then apply it. Because if it isn't applied, if wisdom isn't put into action, then frankly, it does nothing for you. Nothing. It's worthless. And so often, again, we rush to information and there's this disconnect between what we know and how we live and this disconnect between our knowledge and our living becomes a real problem. But wisdom is is when we take that knowledge and we begin to put it into, into action and apply it. And then we see God beginning to demonstrate how um, wisdom brings away a new, a new way of life. And so it's Joseph asks for wisdom, Joseph accepts the wisdom, and then Joseph applies the wisdom. And check this out in uh, chapter 41, verse 37 of Genesis. So he, he, you know, um, Joseph details the plans to Pharaoh. He says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to store up uh, food and these, and that will help us survive the seven years of famine. But then it says this, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom... Uh, one in whom is the spirit of God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne, I will be greater than you. So see Pharaoh, uh, he sees the plan, he understands the wisdom and it takes Joseph now where he says, you are going to be second in command. And so now these dreams that Joseph had had have now merged because he asked for wisdom, because he accepted the wisdom, and because then he applies the wisdom to the situation. Joseph's plans begin to accelerate because they've been merged now with God's plans. 
Joseph's dreams, because he obtain, or wisdom, because he steps into that wisdom, then merges his dreams with God's plans. Because wisdom allows us to understand God's movement in the world. It helps us to understand what God is doing. Wisdom helps us to, um, or it enables us to see when our dreams are out of step with what God desires. But here's the beauty of it. I think it actually slowly transforms our desires more into God's plans. And so wisdom becomes this first step as we navigate the ocean of information around us, the ocean of gospels that this world proclaims, that it's, it's money, it's sex, it's power, whatever it is, those things that say they offer the good life. Wisdom allows us to navigate this world and see that the way of Jesus, the way of following Jesus transforms all of that. You know, I want to close uh, with this story, and it, it, it's about a young man and Socrates, and I find it so interesting, but I'm actually going to read most of it, and it says this, is there's a story about a proud young man who came to Socrates asking for knowledge. He walked up to the muscular philosopher and said, oh, great Socrates, I come to you for wisdom. And so Socrates led the young man through the streets. He led him to the seas and chest deep into water, and then he asked, what do you want? Wisdom, oh, Socrates, said the young man with a smile. Socrates put his strong hands on the man's shoulders and pushed him under the water. 30 seconds later, Socrates led him up. What do you want? He asked. Wisdom, the young man sputtered. Oh, great, wise and so- uh, great and wise Socrates, wisdom. So so- Socrates crunched him under again, and 30 seconds passed, 35, 40. And then Socrates led him up, the man gasping. Um, and Socrates looks at him and says, what do you want, young man? And then it says, between heavy, he, um, heavy, heavy breaths, the fellow wheezed out, wisdom, oh, wise and wonderful. And then Socrates jams him under the water again. 40 seconds pass, 50 seconds passed. He lets him up. What do you want? And then the young man yells, air, I need air. And Socrates looks at him and says, when you want wisdom, as you have just wanted air, then you will have wisdom. How badly... Do you want wisdom in your life? Do you want it like that man wants air? Do you recognize that it is near impossible for us to navigate this world, the ocean of information, the ocean of gospels that this world preaches at us about what the good life looks like, what your dreams should look like? How badly do you want wisdom? Ask for it. But then one more, will you accept it? When God challenges you to lay that or this down, to transform your dreams, to understand a different way to be, will you accept that wisdom? And then lastly, and maybe the the hardest step of all of it, is will you apply it? Will you connect your life with that experience? Because again, the truth is this, that wisdom leads your dreams to God's plans. That's our hope. So let me pray for you guys and then we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want wisdom. We want it um, like that man that wants air. God, may you help us to understand that your way, your way of wisdom leads to life. And so, God, may we learn from the story of Joseph. May we understand what it means to have our dreams merge with your plans. And God, the way to do that is through wisdom. And so, Lord, may you help us. I help my friends here uh, this morning, God, to navigate this world with wisdom. Um, It's difficult. It's hard. Um, but God, we lean into you for that. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good one, guys. Thank you so much, Kevin, for, for sharing in, in our series on Joseph. And I hope you guys and gals could take something from that. And heck, the best part about YouTube uh, and doing this on YouTube is that we get to uh, rewind if we want. You know, if on a Sunday morning we're up there, you can't really watch back what what we talked about you can't be like hold on ryan can you like repeat like the last five minutes what's great is that we can go back and we can and we can pause and we can rewind and we can see maybe there's something you need to hear again so do that as we as we teach on a sunday if you need to pause pause if you need to rewind do that too so i encourage that and, and i just hope that you know i'm praying for for clearing of smoke this week i'm praying for uh, good learning this week for all of you I know a lot of you are super busy and maybe even still figuring out how online school works. So I, I, I'm praying for all of you this week. And I hope that you 
Just have a wonderful week. Come join us in, in life groups on Thursday. If you still need the link for the Zoom call, let me know. Um, if, if, if you need to message me and you don't have my number, just message us on the uh, CPCFC HSM Instagram. Uh, can't wait to see all of you on Thursday and uh, have a wonderful week. See you.